We look at James chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. It says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted. Your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborer who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence, you have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Amen. Amen. Benjamin Franklin said, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Now, for some of you, that resonates and says, that's right. And other people just kind of roll their eyes at that and say, yeah, plans, schmans. In fact, I, in fact, I wonder this morning, if we were to kind of line up uh, the, the entire congregation uh, from one side of the room to the other side of the room, and on, on, on this side of the room, since I'm already over here, and this side of the room uh, over here, it would be the people who are just spontaneous. We, we call them club willy-nilly. You know, whatever comes to, to mind, they, 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 they just, as soon as they think of it, they, they, they do it. No planning. Planning is, is, is anathema to them. So they'd be on this side over here. And then on, on this side over here would be what we'd call the, the, the over planners. Uh, they're, they're, they're making lists all of the time. They're, they're making plans so far out in the future. They're working on this detail and this detail. And they're not only planning for themselves, but they're planning for you. They're planning for strangers that they've never met before. They, they, they got plans for everybody. I kind of wonder, where, where, where do you fit on, on that thing? Are, are, you, are you toward club willy-nilly? Or, or are you closer over here to the, the over-planner kind of people? people. You know, Jesus talks about the importance of planning. Hey, in fact, when Jesus tells some stories, he, he, he really kind of jibes uh, about the lack of planning. Uh, he, he talks about, listen, you wouldn't ever have a, a king that would go to war without counting his soldiers. You wouldn't have a king that would go to war without doing a little bit of reconnaissance trying to see how strong the, the enemy was before he engaged people in war. He, he'd do a little planning and a little bit of counting to see what would happen. And the obvious answer is, well, nobody would do that. He, he, he talks uh, about a person who's building. And he says, before you start building, you make sure you have enough money to finish building. Now, to be honest with you, this was one of my favorite passages of Scripture growing up in school because our rival school started to build a gym and ran out of money. And that half-built gym was there all through junior high, all the way through high school. And I love this passage of Scripture when I come up and said, hey, that's Northside. They, they don't know what they're doing. But you've got a plan. You don't start a project without thinking it through. You've got to make plans. This is how you're going to begin. This is what the middle is. This is what the end looks like. Planning is really important. Jesus reminds us that planning is important. Proverbs is full of, what shall we say, Proverbs about the importance of planning and thinking ahead and looking ahead. Which is why these verses kind of come as a little bit of a surprise. These verses kind of say, hey, easy there on your planning. And maybe your planning isn't as great as you think it is. Take it easy on all of your plans here. The, the emphasis of these words is a little bit uh, surprising. You see, it sounds so, again, it sounds so contemporary to, to us. It says, do not say. 
that tomorrow we're going to go to such and such a place, stay for a year, and to make a profit. They got a business plan. They got an idea. They, they, they've got a, something that they're going to try to apply into life. And, and, and in the day of James, that probably happened fairly often. They would say, you know what? Let's go to Jerusalem. There's money to be made in Jerusalem. You see those crowds that are coming and going all of the time? Man, if we set up shop in Jerusalem, we can make some money. Or, or, or maybe they would say Antioch. Or, or, or maybe they would say Ephesus, the big city there in Asia Minor. Or maybe they'd say Corinth. Boy, you can always make money in Corinth. Or maybe they had really big sites and said Rome. Rome, all roads lead to Rome. All money leads to Rome. Let's go there and to make a plan. And the word is easy there on your plans. Now, we might have some of those same plans today. We might have some of those same plans and say, listen, if I move such and such a place, and if I stay there, or if I take up this extra job, or if I start an online business, or if I start trading in Bitcoin, or if I invest in this market, or if I buy these things, or if I get a couple of rent houses, or if I do all of these things, then we're going to be able to turn a profit. And we're going to get some things done around here, finally. You can hear those words. The reason why you can hear those words is they're not imaginary words. They're something that somebody in your realm of hearing probably has said in the last two weeks. Here's the plan. Well, we're going to do this, and we're going to make these plans, and, and it's going to be great. And yet, there's a little bit of a poke here. In fact, let, let's take a look at this this morning. One of the things that James wants to remind us is that even our best plans are impacted by the stuff of life. Even our best plans are impacted by the stuff of life. Now, you know the stuff of life. It's a very technical term. It just means stuff happens. You know that. He says, those of you who are saying, we're going to go to such and such a place, stay for a year, and make a profit. Like it's that easy. <laughs> I mean, like, like I said, listen, here's the plan. We're going to move to such a place to stay a year, and boom, we're going to make a profit. Man, if it was that easy, everyone would be doing it. In fact, there's just a word of warning here to us just between friends that if someone comes to you and promises you, listen, if you just invest this amount of money, if you just do these things, then boom, you're going to see a profit. I'd be really, really careful. Chances are somebody is lying to you. Somebody is trying to take advantage of you. Someone is trying to separate you from your hard-earned cash because, hey, listen, just trust me. Give me your money, and boom, you'll have a profit. Man, be careful about someone who comes and tells you this. Man, it's one of the great heartbreaks is that there have been some ministries that have been really taken advantage of because somebody came and says, listen, if you, if you will raise this much amount of money from your followers, then we'll be able to double it in three years' time. Boom. Here's your profit. They were Ponzi schemes. But because we're, we're so attracted to a promise that says, here's your profit. So if someone says that to you, man, I, I want red flags to go up all over the place. But also I would say to you, if you tell yourself that, I want you to be careful in that word as well. We, we love confidence. We love vision. We, we love optimism. But at the same time, we have to be careful because we're not sure about a year from now. Well, we're not sure about prophets. He, he says, listen, here's the plan. We're going to go to such and such a place, and we're going to stay for a year, and we're going to make money. He says, really? That, that, that's your plan? That, that, that's, that's what you're going to see happen in a year's time? He says, listen, you can't even handle tomorrow. You've got this plan to turn a profit by going to this place, but, but you, you don't even know what tomorrow's like. And in fact, let's just think through some of the things that we don't know about tomorrow. We don't know what the weather's going to be tomorrow. Now, we've got an app on our phone that's going to tell us. 
But man, I'd like to go through life getting away being as wrong as those weather people are. We don't know what traffic's going to be like tomorrow. You're, you're going to leave work at your regular time. Are you going to breeze through your commute? Or are you going to be stuck an extra 45 minutes someplace? You don't know how you're going to feel tomorrow. Is that crud going to be all of a sudden you're going to wake up and you've got the, the, the crud? Again, a, a very specific medical term there. Uh, but you don't know how you're going to feel. You don't know what the price of gas is going to be tomorrow. And we watch the price of gas and say, that price of gas means it's going down. It's going up. I should fill up today. I should fill up tomorrow. I should fill up yesterday. I should have filled up a year ago. We don't know what the price of gas is going to be. You don't know who's going to be in a bad mood tomorrow. You don't know who you're going to interact with. You're like, whoa, what happened to that person? I was kind of counting on hanging out with them and, and, and just my interaction with them, whether it's my boss, whether it's someone I work with, whether it's somebody in my house, whoa, where did that person come from? You don't know who's going to not show up at work. You don't know if tomorrow while you're eating breakfast in your car going to work, you don't know if you're going to spill stuff all over your clothes and you're going to have to wear clothes that are stained all day long. You don't know that. I don't want you to be overly pessimistic about tomorrow, but I'd be careful with your breakfast. Uh, <laughs> James says, listen, stuff happens. It is not as simple as I'm going to go so-and-so place, and I'm going to do such and such a deed, and I'm going to have the results of profit, and it's just going to be that simple. Anyone who tells you that is lying to you or trying to make profit off of you. And be careful about telling yourself that. So how are we supposed to handle that? Well, what we're supposed to deal with that is that we're supposed to bring in a sense of humility to our plans. It says, when you say, I'm going to go such and such a place, stay for a year and make a profit, the Word of God calls that arrogance. And in chapter 4 and verse 16, it says that arrogance is, it doesn't say annoying, it doesn't say not best, it doesn't say unwise. It says that arrogance is evil. When we come to our plan making, we should have a sense of humility when it comes. Anybody had a plan that fell apart in the last 12 months? And you want to have something they put together and said, here's what we're going to do. Here's how it's going to work out. Here's what's going to happen. Yeah, stuff in life happens. We, we could make a whole list of the stuff in life that bumps us off of our plans. So James says, be careful about the plans that you make because even our best plans are impacted by the stuff of life and we should be humble in how we perceive those things. James also tells us, that our desire for control is limited by our vulnerabilities. You see, that's part of what we want to do in our planning. I don't know about you, but maybe it's me. I'm like, if I plan enough, if I handle enough of the details, then I will be able to control what happens to me. Anybody else have, have an interest in that? That, that, that if I will organize enough, if I will plan enough, if I will handle the details enough, and if I will research enough, and if I will study enough, and I will look into the, all the things, if I do that, then I won't be a victim, and I will have control over my own experience. How's that working out for us? You know, the thing is, is this is not the most comforting word that the word gives us this morning. He says, when you think about your life, he says, what is your life? He says, your life is, it's a mist. It's a mist. Now, if you could think of all the ways that you would like your life to be described, I don't think mist makes the top ten. You know, that person, he's like a mighty oak. I mean, that, that guy is just so strong. That person is as deep as the ocean. That is a mountain of a man. 
And that person is like a river that just, just blesses every place that they go. No, our life is like a mist. We understand mist here uh, because of our proximity to the lake. We, we get that, 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 that mist, that fog that comes and kind of soups everything up. I remember times when we would drive from, from Eunice to go to the airport that we would hate driving at certain times of the year because the, the weather on, on, on a 55 or across 10 going around the lake would be so thick you could barely get in. We know what that, li- what that looks like. Palestine would have the same kind of mists, but because of the, the nature of their climate, those mists and that fog would not last hours, but it would last minutes. There just wasn't enough moisture in the air. So when James says, your life is like a mist, when he's saying it, it's not like, boy, it's souped in for a couple hours here. I'll just wait till later. He is saying, man, it's there. And then when you nudge someone and say, hey, did you see the mist? It's, over. <laughs> it's gone. I don't know the best way to illustrate this for us. But sometimes I'll think about traffic. We have traffic right out the door here. Sometimes when we go across that Mississippi River Bridge, I think, how many people have gone across this bridge? How many people go across this bridge every single day, every single hour? How many people go across this bridge? The traffic is, you ever been across that bridge when it was empty? (laughs) It's always people, 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 people. But there's a way in which James is telling us, that's kind of like our life. You're on the bridge, you cross the bridge, and then it's gone. And another car has taken your place. And another car comes after us just as quickly as you were to sit there and watch every car go by. That is eternity watching our lives go by. James says, listen, one of the reasons why we can't have control over our lives is that you're not a mountain. You are not a mighty oak. You are a mist that just doesn't last. And he says, if you think that you don't last, you ought to check your stuff. It lasts even less time than you do. He talks about your your clothes wearing out because the moths have corrupted. It it talks about your gold and your silver and and probably part of what he's talking about. He could be talking about theft. He could be talking uh, about just corrosion. He he could be talking there about the, the price of those things. Well, we watch that today, don't we? Man, stuff breaks. Stuff that we paid good money for. It doesn't work anymore. Anybody check their retirement fund? Yeah, scared to. I told Susan, stop looking at it. It's not going to be good news anytime soon. Stop looking at it. Because we were watching that. Man, it was a while that, man, I felt bad that I hadn't invested in Bitcoin. Like, man, those people were making billions. Not anymore. It was missed. It's, it's, it's gone. Took some stuff yesterday. Cleaned some stuff up at the house. Took a car load of stuff to, to a thrift store. First of all, every thrift store is full. Everybody's got stuff that they don't want anymore, and they take it. And, and I had my arms around the stuff that I was taking into the thrift store, and it's like, man, I remember when I bought that. Remember when I bought that? Remember when I bought that? And there was a moment in time when I looked at that thing and I said, boy, I've got to have that. And now it's like, I will give it to you if you promise that it never comes back into my house. Man, <laughs> we're missed. And our stuff is half missed. It, it, it doesn't even last as long as we do. And so here we have this sense of, I want to have control, and I've got a plan. When How do we plan when, when we're temporary experiences? How do we do that? James also gives us one more little word about our planning and our, our confidence and our ability to do. He says that our celebrations of success often overlook the contributions of others. 
Our celebrations of success often overlook the contributions of others. Now, what he says here is that some of you have had success. You went to such and such a place, you stayed a year, and you did make a profit. And some of it hasn't corrupted. He says, but you've overlooked how you made that money. And you have not recognized that some of the money that you made has come at the expense of others. In fact, this passage says, your workers who have been robbed of their wages will cry out against you on the day of judgment. Righteous people that you have squashed in your pursuit of your success will be remembered. And what this is saying is, yes, you made money, but some of the money that you made, you weren't supposed to make. He talks here about stolen wages. He talks about fraud. Now, this is not every person who's made money. Keep in mind, most of us are the richest people in the world. But that doesn't take away from the fact that sometimes intentionally people have taken shortcuts, people have earned their wealth off the sweat of somebody else's labor, people have taken advantage of people who have very few options and alternatives, and they sit in the big house celebrating how God has blessed them when really A big part of that accumulation of wealth has been them taking advantage of other people. I'm not saying that the text, the Word of God is saying that. Now, we're not comfortable with those words sometimes, but it tells us that God cares about this topic. God is concerned about this topic. And while we don't want to admit that our systems can be broken and we don't want to admit that our systems need correction and we don't want to admit that some of the success that we've had has come from taking advantage of other people, God says this matters and there is a witness against us because of it. Sometimes our success has come at the expense of other people. Now, some again, that comes with a sense of humility, understanding that the person who has made all of this money has been made possible because some of the people on the front line that work for them that make the least amount of money. And that wasn't just you that did that. But also sometimes it's because we pay people the least amount of money that we can possibly pay them without necessarily saying what is their work worth or what is the need that they have in their life or or, or what is a fair price. It's what is the lowest that I can possibly squeeze out of this person. And God says that's not right. None of that honors him. And he calls us on it. And we need to hear what the word of God says. Now, there is a solution, because this is a pretty negative word here, but there is a solution. There's really a simple solution to all of these things, and that simple solution goes back to the beginning of the text. It says, we're going to go to such and such a place and stay for a year. He says, do not say you're going to go to such and such a place and stay for a year. He says, if the Lord wills we will go to such and such a place and do these things. I want you to hear, God is not against plans. God is not against working hard. God is not against success. But he's against all of those things coming above his will. My success, my plans, my pursuits, God's will. So no, 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 no. Every time that we do this, We are arrogant, we are unsubmissive to God, 
and we are stepping out of his will. But when we say first, what is the will of God? Is the will of God for me to go to such and such a place? Is the will of God for me to stay there for a year? Is the will of God for me to turn a prophet? I don't know. But the question that we're supposed to ask is, what is the will of God in this moment, in this situation? The will of God first. The will of God first. So whether it's your vacation plans, whether it's your Christmas budget, whether it's whether you're going to take that new job, whether it's going to buy a new piece of equipment, whether it's going to be whether you buy the house, whether you lease the car, all of those things, it begins with what is the will, the priority of God for my life here? Not my benefit, not my comfort, not my stuff. What is the will of God? We talked about this a little bit last week. We want the will of God to be more comfortable and successful and easy for us. No, that's the, that's the will of me. But sometimes the will of God is different than that. Make your plans. But make sure it's the will of God first. Pray over them. Bathe it in prayer. Be ready to say, listen, if I don't get a sense that this is what God wants, even if I don't understand why, I'm stopping and I'm backing up. I'm not going to do it. Now, remember our, our, our little graph here between Club Willy Nilly and, and the planners? Well, well Club Willy Nilly is like, man, I'm glad I came this morning because this is a planning problem. This is a sermon just for the planners. That's not true at all. The difference is that the planner is laying all of this stuff out and can determine in advance, I'm going to pray over this as part of my planning process. But the spontaneous folks, They've got to make those determinations moment by moment by moment. Hey, I'm going to do this. Okay, but before you do this, is that the will of God? And I'm gonna, as soon as we're done with this, hey, we should go do this. Cool. But is that the will of God? Now, I will tell you that the spontaneous way of life is a whole lot of fun. And, and by the way, I am the most spontaneous person that I know inside the circle of my plans. So nice big circle of plans inside of that, spontaneous. I, that I am Mr. Spontaneity inside of the circle. There's nothing wrong with either way to live. But both are called for. Before I jump, before I go, before I plan, before I do, the question that matters more than anything else is, what is the will of God in this moment. So, I bet you you got something on your mind right now. I bet you you got something that you're trying to plan. I, I bet you you got something that you're unfolding. I bet you as soon as we're done, you're going to have a brand new idea. So what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to seek what is the will of God in that moment. And so James has talked about such and such a place. This morning I've talked about some real generalities. But this is the moment where such and such becomes real. It's, it's you knowing the things in your life that you're working on, that you're planning, that you're trying to plan. And you take those very specific things in a very specific way. And say, God, I submit this to you. I give this to you. And I'm prepared to drop this, change this, rearrange this. If that's your will. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that your Spirit move in this place. Lord, this is one of those Sundays where this really touches specific places in our lives. 
And Lord, I, I don't want people to respond to my voice or my words, but I want them to respond to you and to your spirit. And so, Lord, I ask that you just give clarity in those, in these moments. We pray this in your name. Amen.